So what exactly is faith? Hey, welcome back, Smart Christians. One question that's asked often and maybe even misunderstood is what exactly is faith? So without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump into the scriptures and see what faith is, see if we can glean what it is. Faith is, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, you've all heard the passage before, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It says, for by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that it was so so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, none of us were there when the universe was created. None of us were there at the foundation of the earth, but we were told about it. And because we were told about it uh, and because we believe some of the other things, we believe what it says about the foundation of the earth, about God creating the earth. But it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I am assured of. Now, by the way, it's not some blind faith just because I was told this, then I'll go ahead and follow. No, faith is a little bit more than that. It's not blind faith. Now, we see the examples in Hebrews 11, as it says, verse 4 it says, Now by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than, than, than Cain. And so, because of his faith, because of his belief, his conviction, his trusting in God, he did what he was supposed to do, what he was told to do. So, what is faith? Faith is simply the word that's there is the word for trust, uh, having his confidence in to believe. Now, I'm going to give one. Uh, an example of what I always use to say what faith is and what it's not. But let me also use a couple of passages in the Bible to also bring about what faith actually is and how it's demonstrated. Recall Peter. Peter is in the boat fishing. Now, Peter's a fisherman. That's what he does by trade. In their trade, they would typically fish at night in the shallow ends. They did not get a lot of fish. And so what they did was they were there mending their nets and so forth. But then Jesus shows up seemingly out of nowhere and he makes a request. And it makes you wonder why in the world would Peter, who is a fisherman, listen to Jesus, who is not a fisherman, right? So let's go to chapter five of verse one in Luke. It says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their net. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him, Simon, that is, to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Now, we know the story that he lets out the net and he gets a, uh, a catch that was so great that he needs help to get it in. Well, the question is, why in the world would Peter, first of all, even let him into his boat, but then two, let this stranger tell him, have him to push out into the deep and to cast his nest? And he said, we hadn't caught anything all night, meaning that the fish ain't biting. So why would he do that? But he says, look what he says. He says, Master, we've toyed all night, indicating that he must know who this person is. Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But look what he says, at your word, because you say so, I will let down my or our nets, indicating that he's had some familiarity with who Jesus is and he knows exactly who Jesus is. He calls the master and says, because you said so, only because you say so. So there must be something special about Jesus already, even before he calls Peter as a disciple. Well, where can we see this at? Well, we can go to John chapter one as Jesus is getting ready to call his disciples. Let's look at this passage. John, this is John the Baptist, though, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, two of John the Baptist's disciples, and he looked and, Jesus, and saw Jesus as he walked by him and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them follow him and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. They came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Now here it is. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon 
Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So that's Peter, Peter's first introduction to who Jesus is. They've been waiting for this Messiah. His brother Andrew has been, and maybe Peter, it doesn't say, but maybe Peter has had some sort of familiarity or some sort of occasion to be with John as well. But certainly Andrew, his brother, is one of John the Baptist's disciples. And he's hearing all this rhetoric, all this teaching, all this talk about this Messiah coming. And then obviously Peter's heard this. And so Andrew goes and gets Peter, says the Messiah, the one we're waiting on, he's here. Well, if Peter had not been waiting on it himself, he would not have gone. And so Peter goes and he meets with him and Jesus says that you, you will be called Cephas. Then something else happens also that probably, it's probably a good chance that Peter knows about this as well. Look at the following verse in verse 43. It says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law also, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed of whom, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So it's probably likely because they're from the same locale. It's not a, it's not a large city. They were also waiting. All these people are waiting on Jesus to show up. And so Peter more than likely has also heard of this account of him knowing exactly who Nathaniel is and telling him where he is. And so it's likely that Peter has heard this account as well. And so Peter has also been waiting. He's probably heard the account of Nathaniel sitting under the tree waiting, and Jesus tells him about that. And so this gets to Peter. And so Peter is probably like, yeah, this guy is amazing. So when, when Jesus shows up to see Peter and tells him to push out, and here's how I tie this together about faith, Peter, knowing who he is, because he trusts who he is, when he says to push out, this doesn't compute, this doesn't make sense, but nevertheless, because you say so, I trust you. What does it say faith is? Faith is the assurance of, let's put it back on the screen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, the conviction of things not seen. And so because I've got this conviction about no matter what you say, I believe it. And because you say it, I will do it. Now, there's also one last thing. Remember, Jesus is walking along the edge. We see it in Matthew and Mark. And he says, come, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then we see Peter and his brother get up. Then he goes down a little further. We see James and John. Well, they don't just get up because some stranger says so. It's because they have some familiarity with what he's done. Peter does. Peter has familiarity with who Jesus is when he pushes out into the deep. And even more so after that great catch, no matter what Jesus says from now, I believe him. That is what faith is. Uh, it's not this hope that maybe something might happen. I'm wishing, I'm thinking there's a good chance, there's a good possibility. Faith is acting on what God says. For example, I use this example over and over again. I think it's a pretty good example. This chair that I'm sitting in, I believe this chair can bear my weight. So if I'm tired, I think that this chair is the right place for me to sit down in and to get a rest. So what do I do to demonstrate my faith? I sit down in it. But now more than just sitting down in it, you know I trust this chair. You know I have faith in this chair because I sat down in it. But not only that, not only did I just sit down in the chair, I sat down in it and I relaxed. I did not brace myself on the floor just in case this chair falls. I did not grab a hold of the desk just in case, just in case I'm not grabbing the desk and brace myself on the floor just in case. I have not extended wires from the ceiling to hold this chair just in case the legs on the chair get out, give out on it. No, I completely trust this chair and I relax in it. That is what faith is. It's believing in uh, the security of this, in this case, this chair, but more to the point in Jesus. So faith is because God says so, I move. I demonstrate my faith in how I move. I demonstrate my lack of faith also in how I move. If I think I've got to do something to help out 
uh, God, if I got to do something to make sure that if I got to kind of connive or kind of go behind the scenes, kind of like Abraham and Sarah did, if I've got to help God out, no, that's not faith. That's a lack of trust. But in this case, we see Peter and his faith. We see other people, according to uh, Hebrews 11, who acted because of their faith. Faith is not uh, a works, but faith is shown by us moving because of what we believe. Amen.